Picture this. One moment your life is at its peak. You are having the career of your dreams. And the next moment you're facing your worst nightmare. Welcome to Her Standards. In this episode of Women You Should Know, our guest faced some of the worst things in her life. She was imprisoned, but for a crime that she did not commit. My name is Quinta Mbori, and I'm glad to be your host. To be part and parcel of this conversation, please talk to us. Find us on social media across all platforms at KTN Home, or you can talk to me directly at Queenie Mbori on Facebook and Instagram or Queenie Saina on Twitter. Teresa. Yes, Queen. How are you? I'm well, thank you. <laughs> it's good to have you on the show, finally. Finally. Thank yes. you so much for having me. We are very excited. Yeah. Uh, you look wonderful, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yes. You too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love your neck piece. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Now, we'll just get straight into it. Mm. Um, a few years ago, yeah. something happened to you. Yeah. Uh, probably your worst nightmare, I don't yes. know. Um, maybe what you can do is just take us through uh, mm. the events of that day. What happened? How mm. did you end up mm. in prison? Yeah. Mm. Indeed, it was such uh, a tough situation. Uh, you do not wake up and work so hard in school and uh, be a law abiding citizen and work so hard at work, you know, to think I'm doing all this to then end up in prison. Not at all, um, and, and, and for me, I was building this career that I passionately loved uh, because I had watched my dad. Uh, he was a career banker for about three decades, and as a young little girl, I'd watch him, and he, he was my hero. And I, 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 you know, I said to myself, when I grow up, I just want to be like dad, work within the financial sector. And so all my studies and all my efforts were geared towards growing that career. Mm -hmm. And you know, God is faithful. I ended up in the financial sector and grew that career ladder, worked there for about a decade. And one day as we were serving a client, a normal day, you know, uh, and, and, and ran those transactions mm -hmm. as per procedure, uh, we pay out the customer. It was about close to 10 million Kenya shillings. And a month later, the customer comes and says, I am not the one who instructed you to pay this money. We were a number of us uh, who had paid out that money uh, because within the bank, you've got to call sign. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, you know, the immediate question was, what happened? Uh, who might have dropped the ball? Uh, and, and, and I participate in the investigations, in the internal investigations, because I also wanted to know where, where did things go wrong, that the bank has been hit, the customer's money has been stolen. Um, and eventually, I, re I, I did not get to see the bank's report after the, all the investigations. A number of people were fired and you know, I thought that maybe the worst thing that would happen to me is I'll never get a promotion because I was one amongst mm. those who were involved in paying out the money or probably maybe one day I'll be fired. I, I, I kept wondering what could happen, but those were the worst case scenarios that I could imagine that would happen. And uh, as I continued on with my work, one fine day, police walk into the banking hall and they say to me, we're here to arrest you. And I say, but you have a wrong, the wrong person, arrest me for what? And they tell me about the transaction. And I really try to push them and say to them, you have the wrong person. But the arresting officer was very categorical. We know that you didn't steal the money. You didn't conspire. You have no wrongdoing, but it's you we are here for and we're going to arrest you. And they arrested me, and uh, long story short, took my fingerprints, took me to court. Uh, at the point of uh, prosecution, they asked me to pay a million Kenya shillings, 
and the case would be dropped. But you know, when you know your values, it becomes very easy to make your, de your, your decision. Mm -hmm. It was categorical, no, I am not paying any bribe, especially when you know I'm innocent. And then two and a half years post-prosecution, we're, we're, we're zeroing in to judgment. They now say to me, this time round, give us five million Kenya shillings so that the judgment can be favorable to you. And I'm looking at the arresting officer and saying to him, but there has been no evidence throughout the two and a half years that I'm the one who stole the money or um, even conspired with anyone. True to his word, that if I don't pay him the five million Kenya shillings, the judgment would not be in my favor. Irrespective of the fact that I had not stolen that money, irrespective of the fact that they knew I hadn't committed that crime, I was convicted to serve a year at Lanata Women Maximum Prison. And at that point, I was a new mom. I had, my, my daughter was only three months old. Oma, oh, she accompanied me to prison. It was so painful. It was really painful. I really felt uh, the injustice, the inequality and in how I had been handled. And the, the world just came crashing. And I wondered if this is the arm of government that's meant to offer citizens mm -hmm. justice and I couldn't get justice here where wow. else where do I turn to it was a very tough time in prison you know uh, your story is not new and, and I'm sure somebody might be asking you know why do we have to keep hearing this story over and over and just like we were discussing before we came here is what happens is many women are going through what you went through. I think I've been, there's something you even wrote that about 70% of women in prison are victims of the system. They are in for the wrong reasons. They are in because they cannot afford it. Uh, let me ask you something. How did it feel being in prison, knowing too well that you are innocent? What, what, what was happening in you? in your mind, in your heart, in your body. What was going on through you feel, your mind? Yeah, yes. you feel silenced. It's like your voice doesn't matter. Because no matter what you say, innocent as you are, those words don't matter. So you feel silenced. It, you, you no longer have a voice. You feel like a nobody. It's like you've been thrown in this pit because it really felt like being in a pit, in hell. And it's been closed and life continues, like you really don't matter. And you know, as you've said, a huge percentage of the women who we were in that pit in hell with are in there unfairly. Most of them can't afford legal representation. You know, we take to prison the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the very, the, 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 the very weak in our society are the ones in that pit of hell. And each one of them would ask me, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? People like you don't come to prison. And I would wonder, so if I had stolen, if I was a thief, people like me don't come to prison. But you know, Queen, that's the truth. We have a system of justice that treats you very different if you are innocent and rich. Who do you know? It doesn't matter whether you killed, whether you siphon, you siphon uh, funds. It doesn't matter what you did. What matters is who do you know? That's the kind of a justice system we have. True, indeed, to the, to the question of these women, what are you doing here? Prison is a place for the poor. The poor, and it doesn't matter how innocent they are. That, that's the huge percentage that's there. And Queen, the most hurting part was that 90% of those women that I met there in that pit, 90% are mothers. And this is the most hurting bit of it. The sole bread winner. So if she's not home taking care of her children, they are by themselves. 
and 60% of their children are under the age of 10. They need their mother the most during those years. And even the most painful part was that 39% did not know where their children were. Oh my God. Because she was picked up in the street. She's a st street trader. She's a hawker. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, she didn't have a mask. She's in prison because she couldn't meet the fine. And she left her children behind. You know, there are so many alternatives to deal with these issues that take these women to prison. But they break families. Instead of using those alternatives, they break families. They break these women. It's really wrong. You know, um, I have a daughter. So when you're talk, tell, talking about um, going to prison with your child, mm -hmm. aged three months, what is going on in my mind I, I can't even explain because <clears throat> I know for sure that there are women who are in prison and they are not with their children at the same time there are women who are in prison and they have their children with them like you what is the situation like for them what do these children eat where do they sleep where do they clothe where do they go to school and, and how does that institution, how does that environment mm -hmm. affect them as they grow up? It's beyond words what these women and their children go through. Whether these children are in prison with their mother or they have been left on the outside alone. Our sisters, our brothers, our future, we are tormenting them. This is not the way to treat these women know these children. When I went into prison, uh, I was put in charge of the children, uh, what we call the nursery. Yeah. And so the women would go to do their daily chores where they have been assigned their daily uh, duty. Yeah. So at that time, uh, I was taking care of between 50 to 60 children and their mothers would then go to do their daily chores. And as I would stay with these little children, you know, I even forgot that I am in prison because the empathy you get when you look at these little innocent children growing up in prison, so innocent, but they don't know where they are. And things like eggs, they wouldn't even understand what that is. You know, they'd say it's a ball that falls down and it cracks, it, it cracks and something yellow comes out mm -hmm. of it. No toys. It was really, really bad. The food, if well-wishers would not come to bring us some donations, rice and green grams and uh, Vaseline and diapers, it's that time that I knew that a woman could take a paper bag because by then we hadn't burned the paper bag. The paper bag was such a luxury because that's what they would tie as a, as a diaper. And these children would burn because you can, she's in prison for years. No one comes to visit this paper bag as, di as diapers. As a diaper. You know? Nothing and in between the skin. And nothing. And the oh my God. Nothing. And you can imagine these tens of children and all these paper bags that are being tied seriously and the woman is in here because she was arrested because she didn't have a license really that's how we are addressing economic issues in this country and another thing a majority were youths young young girls 20 year olds i mean she she cleared uh, school no job, there's no job. So she had to do what she had to do to survive. To survive. Yeah. And this is where we push them. And prisons, I mean, we still have the colonial structures. You know, these were the colonial structures that were put in. It's still the same ones, you know. And they were not built for women, nor children. They were for men, literally, if you look at the infrastructure. So even for a woman 
it's already difficult being in that space. A small cell with one toilet for hundreds of women. No beds, you know, it, it really was bad. There is some improvement in the infrastructure, trying to bring some dignity, but there's still so much more that needs to be done. So you can imagine a little child growing up in that situation. So when you think about nutrition, when you think about health, when you think about the development of this child, you know, the very early days of this child and what they have been, it's very difficult to repair this. Eventually, when they leave prison, it's very difficult to repair the damage that has happened in the early days of this child. So it's lifelong trauma for this baby. The language that is used in prison, it's not a place you wake up and people are soothing you. It's a correctional institution that's very punitive. So it's very difficult for this child growing up there. Is it a must that this mother goes to prison, surely? Petty offenses, these simple crimes, you know. If this woman is not a threat to society, let them serve an uncustodial sentence. There are so many alternative dispute resolution modes, you know. If she didn't wear the mask, is it a must she spent six months behind bars, leaving her children? There are other ways to deal with it. So it was very difficult to date myself. I'm still dealing with the issues that that imprisonment brought, not just to me, health-wise, mind, emotional and all that, but also for my daughter. And we're still dealing with the issues that affected the children that went through that system. And you know, I mean, I can say this with a lot of conviction that you can afford it. There's another woman who cannot afford it. Yeah. So what happens to their child? Exactly. Mm. Exactly. They are angry. They are traumatized. They can see how mom is trying to make ends meet. I, the other day we had of a child who committed suicide because the mom was not able to provide lunch. It's so, it's, it's heavy, mm -hmm. it's heavy. And we really need to think about the economic impact that not just the poverty, the unemployment, but the pandemic has brought with it. It's tougher for those who are poor and vulnerable in the first place. This is an added misfortune that they have to deal with no one saw it coming yeah true. but i can assure you queens that if covid 19 was a poor man's disease it, we would not even be giving it the attention it's, we are giving it now there are so many diseases we don't give attention to because you know what we can afford to treat ourselves there's, there's good hospitals we will check ourselves in uh, water situation, we will sort ourselves in. Education, check. Our children can go to good schools. You know, as long as we can check, 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 and our money can take care mm -hmm. of it. Well, the poor, they can you know, sort themselves they can out. sort themselves out. But because COVID-19 is, is, is an equalizer, now, oh my goodness me, we're talking about our health infrastructure. Why didn't we talk about health infrastructure before? You know, um, you have said in the past, again, that if you look at the location of prisons, they are so far away, away from family, away from, uh, away from civilization. Yeah. And looking at what is happening to the plight of children yeah. in prison, children behind bars, innocent children behind bars, because they did not choose to be born behind bars. Yeah. If you were to address someone who is supposed to deal with this directly, yeah. what would you tell them? Just face the camera yeah. and, and just say something before, yeah. we, then you can go, take a short break. Yeah. Um, to those who are duty holders, duty bearers and right holders, we don't need to take every woman to prison, especially if she is not a threat to society. Let us embrace the non-custodial sentences. Let us embrace the alternative dispute resolution mechanisms because they are there when a woman goes to prison her entire family goes to prison with her and it takes years on end to rebuild that life even post imprisonment 
at the time of pronouncing that judgment find out is she a mother who is left taking care of her children is it a must that she goes to prison or can we address the issue in a different manner let us not take these women as we do especially because of petty offenses to prison let it not be an option yeah on that note we want to take a short break pay some bills we are talking to Teresa Njoroge. She is the co-founder of Clean Start. Clean Start gives women, ex-prisoners, a second chance to rebuild their lives. Uh, we want to talk about that process, the inspiration behind Clean Start, and some of the initiatives that they are doing, and how you, watching us from home, can be part and parcel of uh, reconstructing the lives of women who have been behind bars. Don't go away. Hit us up on social media. Talk to us. Tell us what you think. Tell us how you can, you can uh, how you want to be involved. We, we are available as KTN Home across all social media platforms. But also you can talk to me directly at Queen Imbori on Facebook, Instagram and Queenie Saina on Twitter. Don't go away.